Well, we are in the book of Matthew. We've been going through this book of Matthew. We're in chapter 6, beginning with the 19th verse. And um, we're going to read the rest of the chapter. I don't know whether I will get it all done today. But if not, we've got next Sunday, the Lord willing, the church don't rise. I'm okay with the church rising. How about you? Amen. Amen. That's pretty cool. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Take your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, the Word of God is always lit up at Ozark Full Gospel Church. Amen. You can follow us. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where your and, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's talking about two types of treasures. Verse 22, And the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And this is a good eye and a bad eye. Verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And this is two masters just can't work together. Verse 25 through 30 he talks about don't worry. How I many need to hear that? Don't worry. Jesus says, therefore, I say unto you, take um, no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat and the body more than clothing or raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take ye thought for, for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today, is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow, tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day, or today, sufficient is our problems as the evil thereof. I want us to notice in verse 25 through 34, he, Jesus has said over and over, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Because when you put God first, God takes care of our needs. Amen? I want to use for a subject this morning, to things be the glory. He said, whoa, preacher, that's wrong. You're absolutely right, it's wrong. But people do it all the time. To things be the glory. You know, we come to church, and you can go ahead and be seated. I'm going to rant and rave a little bit. You know, we come to church, and we sing, to God be the glory. We gather around the Bible and Bible study and shout, to God be the glory. We hear the preaching and we shout, to God be the glory. We come out and we pray and talk to the Lord and we shout, to God be the glory. 
We praise and worship God, and we shout, to God be the glory. And so many times we walk out of the church, and it's two things be the glory. Jesus Christ is trying to tell us that the abundance of life, the quality of life, is not in the abundance of things we have. We live in a world that's very materialistic. If it wasn't for things, we'd be doing really good. Now, some folks say, well, wait a minute, I just need more things. I'm sure you heard the bumper sticker that said on the back of the pickup truck by a good old boy, he who dies with the most toys wins. Well, he's still dead. And his toys still belong to somebody else after he's dead. Things are essential in some areas. That's why in, in the beginning of reading the verses, we talk about a treasure of earth and a treasure of heaven. There's the treasure, two treasures. One treasure is the things that we treasure here on earth. The other treasure is the tre things that we treasure up in heaven. One thing I want to do, the older I get, is I want to leave more treasures behind for those I love. I want to leave treasures behind. Even if the rapture takes place, I want to leave a treasure behind those who miss the rapture, saying, he's gone, he walked with the Lord. It's God that took him home. I'm grateful for the things that the Lord has given me. The shirt on my back, the shoes on my feet, my pants, my coat jacket. I'm very thankful for the clothing that I have. I'm thankful for the food that I eat, and boy, do I eat. I'm thankful for the, the, you know, the car that I drive, even if it is a Chevy. It needs a Chevy demon cast out of it. Or maybe it's the guy driving, I don't know. Hey, don't preach to yourself. Okay. I, I've got personalities going here. But so many times people live a life of things to things be the glory. We need to learn that God is not opposed to us having things. But around those things that God has blessed us with, we should be functioning and loving and surrounding our life in Christ. We should be living for God and not allowing things to drift us away from our prayers, our worship, our service to God. I am, um, Jesus talked about these things and I'm gonna give you the outline and I wanna read something to you that's very amazing. In, in verse 19 through 21, you have two types of treasures. Now, I mentioned uh, Tanner's funeral at the funeral. Yesterday, I mentioned Tanner left so many great treasures behind. And it's important that we understand there's treasures we can leave behind. And then there's treasures that don't matter that we leave behind. But then we can lay up treasures in heaven, and it will be eternal. Two types of treasures. Then there's the good eye and the bad eye. That's found in verse 22 and 23. A good eye will focus on Jesus Christ. A good eye will focus on the future. A good eye will focus on holiness and righteousness under the Lord. A bad eye will get you extremely in debt and can't pay your bills. A bad eye will get you into lust. A bad eye will get you into trouble. A bad eye will get both of your eyes black if you ain't careful. You don't want to black your eye. A bad eye fills one full of darkness. Verse 24 says there, there's two masters, in the, and these two masters cannot work together. You'll either serve one or the other. You can't serve the world, mammon, the things of the world, and still serve God. And then verse 25 through 34 Jesus spends a lot of time telling us, don't worry, I've got this. Don't worry, God has this. Got to take care of you. Verse 25 and 26 says, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or what you're going to wear. Verse 28 and 29 says, don't worry about how you look. 
How do I look? Well, you're not to worry about how you look. Now, I'm not telling you guys to not go to the mirror. God, God bless you. Go to the mirror first before you come to church. And obviously, it, it hasn't helped some of you. But go to the mirror. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying don't worry about how you look. I am saying that you shouldn't live a life in which you, it, it's all about appearance. It's not all about appearance. It's about a relationship with God. Don't worry about how you look. Everybody wants to worry about their image and nothing else. It doesn't matter to me. So I like your preaching. I really don't give a flip whether you like it or not. Well, you'll never draw a crowd like that. That's okay. I didn't start preaching to draw a crowd. I started preaching because God told me I had to. He's going to kill me. <laughs> then in verse 27, it says, don't worry about what people think. There's so many people that's always worried about what somebody thinks. What is people saying about you? How do people perceive me? And Jesus said, don't worry about what people think. Notice verse uh, 27, I love this verse. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubic unto his stature? You think, you, that's not talking about whether you're six foot or six foot one. That's not talking about your height. He's talking about your stature in position. It says, which of you can worry yourself, you know, think deeply and add one cubic or add one blessing to your standing in position with others. You can't do that. Notice in verse 34, don't worry about tomorrow. I love that, don't you? Don't worry about tomorrow. Verse 34, take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself, the things of itself. Sufficient unto day is the evil thereof. How many would agree that you've got enough on your plate one day at a time. Amen. One day, at, one day at a time, we've got enough on our plate. And I want you to understand that it should always be glory to God. We should, we should live a life Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Glory to God. Not to things be the glory. I don't read very often comments by someone else, but this is so good. This is from the book Overcoming Materialism, and it offers an analysis. The author is John MacArthur, and John MacArthur talks about things that begin to possess us if we don't get a handle on it. It begins like this. Mr. and Mrs. Thing are a very pleasant and successful couple. At least that's the verdict of most people who tend to measure success with a thingometer. And when the thingometer is put to work in the life of Mr. and Mrs. Thing, the results are startling. There he is sitting on a luxurious and very expensive thing, almost hidden by the large number of other things. Things to sit on, things to sit at, things to cook on and things to eat from, all shiny and new, things, things, things. Things to clean with and things to wash with, things to clean and things to wash, things to amuse, things to give pleasure, things to watch and things to play, things for the long, hot summers, things for the short, cold winters, Things for the big thing in which they live. Things for the garden. Things for the lounge. Things for the kitchen. Things for the bedroom. Things for the four wheels. Things on two wheels. Things to put on top of four wheels. Things to pull behind the four wheels. Things to add to the interior of the thing on four wheels. Well, Mr. Thing, I've got some bad news for you. What's that, he replies. You can't hear, I can't hear you. The things are in the way. I can't hear you. The things are in the way, Mr. Thing says. 
But then that's the problem with things. Look at the things standing outside your house. Whether it's value of the secondhand thing or dealer, it means a lot to you. But then an error in judgment, a temporary loss of concentration, and that thing can be a mass of mangled metal being towed off to the junkyard. In spite of how silly this sounds, we are basically committed to acquiring things. Sadly, people in Jesus' day were not that different from us. They were also basically committed to acquiring things. They had their hearts set on investing in themselves. I'll continue with my little thoughts concerning that. One day your thing will die and they'll put you in a thing. And then they'll lower you into a thing called a grave. So many times people think they can't live without the things. And Jesus Christ is trying to tell us that there's something more valuable than just things in your life. I thank God for things, but I'm not going to, to, to things be the glory. I'm not going to give glory to the things. I'm going to give glory to the God of every good and perfect gift that cometh down from above. Things are wonderful, but if things keep you out of church, if things keep you from the Word of God, if things keep you from serving God, if things keep you from praying and talking to God, if things keep you from honoring God, then you are saying to things, to things be the glory. Not me, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. I'm thankful for everything the Lord has given me. But I want you to understand that God is a giver and God has given us wonderful things, but it was never intended for the gift to crowd out your love for the gift giver, Jesus Christ. Did you know God's a giver? I said, God's a giver. I never have to worry about our church giving to needs that are in the church, our people, because you know God and you are givers. I don't have to preach on tithing. I don't have to preach about honesty because everybody in our church, and I say everybody, by faith I'm including everybody, are givers. It might startle you to understand that the word, the word love is found 714 times in your Bible. The word believe is found 272 times in your Bible. The word pray is found 371 times in your Bible. But the word give is found 2,152 times. See, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. And God so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, for our sins. And I'm not going to have my life clouded up with trying to pursue the things of this earth, which is going to shortly disintegrate. I need to focus on eternal treasures. Yes, I want to leave treasures behind to my children. Yeah, and I'm not talking about monetary things. I'm not talking about riches. I'm not a rich guy. I'm on television, but I'm not a rich guy. You say, why are you not a rich guy? Because I'm too honest to be rich as a preacher. Uh, that went over like a lead balloon. <laughs> and Jesus Christ says, you, you know, store up treasures in heaven. Where moth, that's speaking of clothing. See, in those days, riches to the common man in the day of Christ was special clothes. It's not so much with me now because my special clothes I grow out of. But special clothes. They considered riches grains and seed. And then there was the more luxurious gifts such as pearls, silver, and gold. Did you know a pearl can get a disease? I didn't know that. Somebody gave Judy a big string of pearls and it was a few years later 
I looked and there was something wrong with it and we took it to the jeweler and the jeweler said, it's sick. Well, I didn't know it could get sick. It's a pearl. And they doctored it. They got over it. <laughs> In those days, pearl, silver, and gold. They would say the pearl, silver, and gold. But Jesus Christ said, when you store up these things in verse 20, rust corrupt, moth for the clothing, rust for the uh, corrupt, and where thieves do break through for the steal. Store up your riches so thieves can't steal. Where your treasure is there will your heart be also. If you are so caught up in your things, that's where your heart is. This is a rather hard sermon today. Not because I'm hard, but because you're really poor listeners. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Get over it. Go to Lowe's and get you a ladder and get over it. Come on. Now, in those days, a lot of the houses were made of mud. And they called the thieves mud pit thieves. That's what they called them, mud pit thieves. Because the thieves would dig through the mud and get into the house, the hut, and steal your riches. Jesus Christ said, you don't have to have a mud hut. You can send those treasures to heaven where they will not be broken into and stolen. And you'll have riches and blessing. We need to use our wealth to promote the gospel. We need to use our wealth to show great principles and honesty to our children. We need to use, and when I say use, I want you to understand that money is a great servant, but it is a hellish master. And money is a wonderful thing. Money's not evil. In fact, money's neutral. It's what you do with money. It's whether it's good or bad. And Jesus goes on to speak about two eyes. You got a good eye and a bad eye. The bad eye says, ooh, ooh, I gotta have that thing. Ooh, ooh, there's another thing. Oh, wow, ooh, there's another thing. I get this thing and this thing and this thing, this thing and this thing. And two years later, you're having a thing yard sale. Because now your things have become coveted valuables to those who chase around in yard sales. That's a horrible affliction to succumb to, yard sale chaser. Amen. Just put a sign out, yard sale, and they'll come from everywhere to get your things. That thing you paid $1,000 for is going to go for seven bucks. The thing. Amen? Come on, I'm preaching better than you're responding. But if your eye is single and you're looking to the things of God, then your whole life will be full of light. But if your eye is selfish and it's all about you and what you can get, then your life will be full of disappointment, sorrow, and as Jesus called it, darkness. No one can be happy trying to serve themselves to be happy. No one will ever be joyful or happy trying to produce happiness and joy in their own life. You'll only be happy by trying to produce joy and happiness in other people's lives. That's how it works. That's how Jesus did it. Amen. Woo, praise the Lord. You say, well, preacher, every time I come to church, people talk about money. You're lying. Not here. I'm talking about things. To things be the glory. Is that going to be, is that going to be you Monday, to things be the glory? Is that going to be you this week or next month, to things be the glory? Are you going to allow family, friends, grandchildren, your job, 
instruments around you to keep you from focusing with one eye on the Lord full of light, or are you going to allow your eye? You say, well, I've got to take care of things. You're right. We need to take care of things, but only in the energy and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, I'm preaching better than you're responding right now. Hello. And so if, our light, if we have one eye that's, that's evil, then we'll be feel, full of darkness. Two masters can't work together. Notice it says, you can't serve God and mammon at the same time, verse 24 says, because you'll end up cleaving to one with love and to the other with hate or disobedience. You cannot serve mammon. You say, what is mammon? Well, you, uh, the short term is money. The, the, the all-conclusive definition is anything that you think you can't live without. That's mammon. And you can't serve God and mammon at the same time because if your mammon is sinful pleasures, then you can't serve God because God won't honor your sinful pleasures. Hello? You said, wow, what a, what a great Mother's Day sermon. You got that right. See, I thought I was coming to church to hear a Mother's Day sermon. Well, you are. This is Mother's Day and this is a sermon. Now, verse 25 down to verse 34 talks about um, not to worry. Trust God. Don't worry about what you're going to eat, drink, or what you're going to wear. Don't worry about how you look. Don't worry about what people think. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just trust God. Amen. Amen. I know people that worry, 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 worry. Just worry all the time. You get worried if you're not worrying. What's wrong? I'm not worried. I'm worried now. Oh, that makes it better. I can worry now. Amen. My dad used to tell me, if you worry, you'll have warts. If that were true, everybody in this room would be warty. Amen. The Bible says the fowls of the air, they don't, have you ever noticed the fowls of the air, they don't worry, they sow not, neither do they reap, they gather into barns, neither do, neither do they gather their stuff into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are they not much better than, are you not much better than they? And some folks says, well, see there, if God takes care of the birds, then I don't have to work. Have you watched a bird? They work a lot. I wouldn't work near as hard as they do for a worm. Birds work. Amen. And then he talks about, what am I going to wear? Verse 28, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they sow or spin. And yet Solomon, uh, I say unto you, yet Solomon... Even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Did you know the only one that really is dressed here in our passage of Scripture in glory is the lily, the wild lily of the field that God made? God put glory on the lily of the field, the wild lily of the field. He put glory on it. Solomon in all of his riches... Solomon in all of his apparel, Solomon in his crown, Solomon with all that he had, could not even compare to the wild lily that's growing out in the field, the glory that God had put upon that beautiful lily. And I think when Jesus said that, the field was just full of lilies at that time. And they were looking at the lilies. There are those that worry about what they're going to do tomorrow. They're worried about what's going to happen, worry about what they're going to eat. You know, I came from a, uh, there was a, 11 of us in our family. I had 10 siblings. Mom and dad took care of all 11 of us in a wonderful way. Mom was an expert at cooking something out of nothing. I'm serious. My mom was incredible. I went to school one time, and the teacher read me a story about stone soup. 
rock soup. I ran home and said, Mom, Mom, my teacher's crazy. She read a book to me that says they make soup out of rocks. I didn't know Mom didn't have no food at that time in the house. She said, Honey, that's true. It makes the best soup. She said, now, son, go out in the field and get you a rock. Make sure it's not a sand rock, and make sure it's not in a cow pile. <laughs> she, I went out and got the rock, took it in, and said, Mama, Mama, make me some soup. And Mama washed the rock real good and cleaned it up real good with soap and water. She put a, a pan of boiling water on the stove, and she put a little grease in it. She put a little bit of seasoning in it, and she boiled that, and that was the best stone soup I ever eat in my life. But there's one thing as a little boy I never worried about. I mean, I, down at the creek kitchen, crawdads, a little boy, I never worried, oh man, I wonder what mommy's gonna feed me today. I never worried about, you know, I might starve. I didn't worry about my shoes. In fact, in fact it was better if I didn't have any. I didn't worry about my clothes because mama could just do them pads, you know. She'd sew them on first, and then it came out with that newfangled stuff you could iron on. She'd iron on a patch. Now, if I'd have just been living in your generation, the younger generation, it, I could have just let my knees stick out and it'd been in style. But I never worried. As a little boy, I never worried about what mom was going to feed me, what dad was going to do, because mom and dad, the, the job was for them to take care of me. And I want you to know, quit worrying. The job for God is to take care of you. Amen. Give the Lord a praise. The job for God is to take care of you. Woo! Amen. People worry all the time. Amen. Bible says that not only will God feed you, but he'll clothe you in verse 36. And you don't have to worry, but it, all you need to do is seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, verse 33, and all these things shall be added unto you. Don't worry about tomorrow. God holds tomorrow in his hand. Don't worry about what you're going to do in old age. You'll get there. Don't worry about it. Now, should we not prepare? Yes, we should prepare. Just like you need to stop by the mirror in the morning. Now, we should do what we can. We need to take care of things. And we need, to, we need to make all the money we can, can all the money we can get, and it, so we can give it to other people and store up treasures in heaven. I'm glad that people are givers in our church, and I, I just rejoice in that. There are some people that have money bags. They are money bags. And others have worry bags under their eyes. Some people don't have money bags, but they just have worry bags under their eyes. Sometimes I have worry bags under my eyes. What are you worried about? None of your business. That's why I preach to myself too. Say, so, well, when you get old, you get them bags anyway. But hey, listen to me. There's a lot of truth to Losing your hair, turning gray hair, turning white hair, and money bags under your eyes. You just didn't get there through old age. I got three people in this auditorium that actually like me right now. <laughs> and they may be hypocrites just pretending. Say, preacher, I don't know how to take you. Well, I don't know how to take you. So there, we're even. Sometimes you get them eye bags under your eyes because you're not feeling good. Usually them eye bags is because you don't have good circulation, you're retaining water. There's something going on. You can tell I'm a great doctor. I remember one time I went to the doctor. I was out in Carson Valley, Nevada, and went to the doctor. I was, I was 40 years old, and I walked in, had high blood pressure. Walked in, the doctor looked at me, and he said, you look awful. I thought to myself, 
I'm in the wrong doctor's office. <laughs> you look awful. He said, you got bags under your eyes. He said, you have high blood pressure. He said, I'm going to give you some of these pills. Now, some people have high blood pressure because your kidneys are not functioning properly. Some people have high blood pressure because you were born very stressed out. Some people have high blood pressure because they're just too fat. Some people have high blood pressure because they're too skinny. Some people have high blood pressure because they just have high blood pressure. Did I cover all the bases yet? I'm trying to. Just a few more shovels and I'll get a good hole dug for me. The doctor said to me, he knew I was a preacher, and he said to me, I'm going to give you some pills, and you start taking them every morning and every evening. We'll get that blood pressure down. And he said, when you quit worrying, come back and see me, and I'll take you off the pills. I thought, doc. He said, no, preacher, slow down. Don't worry. Got to take care of you. And when you get a handle on it, Prayed up, right with God. Now, this is the doctor talking to me. Right with God. Come back. I'll give you, I'll, I'll take you off this blood pressure medicine. You know, he did that. He did that. And I got off of it. Now, some of you, on, I'm on blood pressure right now. I'm on, I mean, it's really up right now. But anyway, I, 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 I have blood pressure pills. I'm, taking, I'm not trying to badmouth anybody. I take blood pressure pills right now for myself. My blood pressure runs about a, 110 over 60, 55, 60. My heart rate's about 45. Right now it's about 50 or 60 probably. It lowers when I preach. And you say, well, preacher, you're sick. No, I'm not sick. I, I just want you to understand that I'm taking the blood pressure. You say, well, why, preacher? Do you worry? No, I'm old. That doctor told me, he said, when you turn 40, your warranty goes out. <laughs> he said, from this day forward, you'll see me more often. You're 40 years old, your warranty wears out. I mean, would agree with that. Amen. Amen. I don't know how they plan it. God didn't plan it this way, but I don't know how people plan the car industry, they plan the car to last exactly to the warranty and then kaput, it's gone. <laughs> they know how to do that, don't they? They'll sell you a new car and it'll come on at a certain time, bells and whistles, and you got to go to somewhere else to a computer technician just to get the light to go off and the siren, the lights and flashing lights to go off because you got to have a technician that is a computer expert to just get the light off of your dashboard. Give me a 1967 Ford Mustang <laughs> that you can put a set of points in and take a pop tab. They don't even have them anymore. A beer tab, but I'm a preacher, so it's a pop tab. Pull it out, set the points, and drive on down the road. I've done that many a time. But I want everybody to know that we're living in a different, disturbing time. I think in the next few years, you're going to see machine merge with man. It's already done that spiritually, but physically, machine's going to start merging with man. That's coming. And it's probably part of what took place before the flood of Noah. Some things that were beginning to happen. We're seeing those things. Have you noticed how it is just, it is just avalanched in the last 10 years? It is just, I mean, it just went crazy the last 10 years. In fact, what little bit of lick of sense people have in some areas, it's gone. Common sense has just about went out with the greatest generation that ever lived. In World War II, common sense is about gone. But the Bible isn't gone. I'm going to keep preaching. 
I'm gonna preach till the day I get raptured to be with the Lord. Amen. I've been writing a book called My Name is Adam. Always wanted to speak up for Adam in the Genesis. And I always wondered why the Bible doesn't mention when Eve died. And I, and I began to pray, when did Eve die? It's not recorded in the scripture. So here I am, you know, Adam died at 930 years old. Give me a little glimpse into the book. He died at 930 years old. I believe personally that Eve died at the same time. And the reason I believe that is they took the forbidden fruit at the same time. And Eve was made out of the exact DNA and same material that was in Adam. They made it the same. And not only that, God said concerning Adam and Eve, I'm going to name you Adam. And that's why I believe Eve died at the same time. Can't prove it. I wasn't there. Don't want to be there. But I, that's a good thought. Amen? It's a good thought. Because we are one flesh as husband and wife. And they were really one flesh. I mean, extremely one flesh. And what we know about DNA now today, we know that death and the seed of death and seed of life is pretty much embedded in the DNA. We know that. Why did I get there? I haven't got a clue. But there you go. The book will be ready in several years. You can have a copy for $930, the same age as Adam. So why is it going to take so long to have it ready? Because Judy's got to proof it. Stand with me. i got to stop. Stand with me. Josh's going to come bring a song. Are you, have you been worrying? Have you been stressed? If you have, this would be a good place for you to come at the altar and just unload your, your sorrow, unload your pressure at the throne room of God. This would be a great time for you to give you mothers or fathers. You know the greatest gift you can give your grandchildren, your children, the greatest gift you could ever give them is that when you die, they know where you went. That is the greatest gift that a grandmother and a grandfather can give their grandchildren and their children is when they die, they know where they went. That's the greatest gift. That's the greatest gift I can give my children. That when I'm gone, if the Lord tarries, my children know exactly where I'm at. And I can't do that just because I say I'm saved. I do that because they've lived, they've watched me live, I'm saved. Amen? And that's the greatest gift you can give your children. Greatest gift you can give your friends is the fact that they'll, they know when you go that you're going to heaven. That, the, that just solves all doubts. Amen? Hallelujah. We're going to invite, we're going to encourage you to come to an altar and talk to the Lord. You're not coming to a church. You're not coming to me. You're coming to Jesus Christ. As you make that step forward, altar's open. Josh, go ahead. <laughs>